Pat and I went to have a quick breakfast while Tina returned to the print shop to tell Ted to meet us at the corner of the campus. After breakfast, I ran up for my purse and toothbrush, and we were off. Pat recognized Ted when he honked the car horn. I didn't. I ran to the back seat. Pat sat in front. Ted greeted Pat and then extended his hand to me, looking sadly into my eyes. I put my hand in his, but could think of nothing to say to him. I felt relieved when, soon after we started, Pat asked Ted some technical questions about printing. Ted took us to a fantasy world I didn't know existed, an immense factory building set in landscape gardens and surrounded by a park. The entrance walls were covered by slogans similar to those at the former university, but the rest of the environment was an electronic wonderland. Ted told us Tissy and Sabina were working with the crew developing a vehicle that would transport a person to any part of the world in a few minutes. He led us to a large room full of computers and electronically operated machine tools. The walls were covered with diagrams and photographs of vehicles. I immediately saw Sabina with a group of people studying a complex wiring chart. Sabina turned, grinned, and nudged the young woman next to her. I couldn't believe my eyes when Tissy jumped and ran toward me. Hi, sis. I thought I'd never see you again. She shouted as she threw her arms around me. You look great. Isn't this place something? Tissy, you look so happy, so healthy. I didn't recognize you. Three weeks with Sabina plus some new clothes was all it took, sis. Let me look at you, Tissy. You look younger than you did ten years ago. You're beautiful. I couldn't get over her vigor. She wasn't at all the person I'd known in the garage. Tissy hugged Sabina and shouted proudly, Hey, listen to the compliments I'm getting, and listen to who's giving them. Then she ran to me, turned me around, and exclaimed, Holy Mary, Mother of God, Sabina, do you actually keep this jewel all to yourself all year round? I blushed and started to cry. Thank you for being so nice to me, Tissy. I wasn't very nice to you. Tissy returned to me, pressed me tightly against her, and whispered, You were a gem, sis. I pecked her lips and whispered, You're lying. You're the gem. Tissy pulled Sabina toward me. How about giving sis a tour of the place? This vehicle won't go anywhere for a while yet. Hey, Ted, come on. I remembered Pat. Wait, Tissy, I haven't introduced my friend. Did he come with you? Tissy asked, turning to Pat. Sorry there, I didn't see you. I pulled Pat's hand toward Tissy's. This is Pat Klesik. He's helped me understand a great deal of what's been happening. Then I introduced Pat to my two best friends, Sabina Nachalo and Tissy Avis. Pat shook Tissy's hand, then Sabina's, and asked, Another Nachalo? Is it the name of a sect? An order of some kind of sorority? Tissy tried to help him. One of them is the other's aunt, although I can't remember which. Are you the aunt, Sabina? Sabina answered, I'm my own mother, Tissy, so I can't very well be the aunt, can I? Tissy told Pat, just act as if they're sisters. Have you ever seen two more gorgeous sisters? Displaying Tissy to Pat, Sabina said, look at who's talking. Would you believe she was released from a prison hospital only three weeks ago? Ted added, when she came out, she looked like a corpse. Incurable dope addict, they called her. A week after she was out, she was just like a kid, all cured. Tissy pulled Ted's beard. Sure, I got cured, because I had an old man like you to take care of me. I was hypnotized by Tissy. She really was like a child. Her enthusiasm, her energy, her rebirth were every bit as fantastic to me as the strikes and occupations. Maybe what's happening is that we're all becoming children again. Our rigid roles and characters are dropping off like dried skin. We're fascinating to each other because each one of our acts might be a total surprise. At any instant, our personalities might change completely. Like children, we're not exhausted by what we've been and are. Life is ahead of us. We're no longer dead. Tissy announced, if no one's got any more compliments, let's start. But if anyone has more nice things to say about me, I'll stay all day. I love it. Sabina kneeled in front of Tissy, kissed Tissy's hand, and quoted, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Tissy danced around Sabina and laughed. Oh, but my eyes are nothing like the sun. Music makes a much more pleasant sound, and when I walk, I always stay on the ground. Raising Sabina off the ground, she asked her gypsy tutor, Did I get it right? Word for word, Tissy. Next week, when the whole world becomes our toy, everyone will speak in verse, their own verse. Tissy sandwiched herself between Sabina and me. Pat and Ted trailed behind, and the tour began. Sabina was like a guide to a foreign delegation, and I was as much of a tourist as I had been and had continued to be in the garage. Yet I wasn't as much of a tourist as Pat. Sabina, Tissy, and the place itself were more than his all-encompassing intellect could absorb. He was completely at sea. The tour began in the room in which we stood. Sabina pointed at pictures and diagrams and spoke of vehicles that would transform human beings into birds. She described the group's current project. 
a vehicle not much larger than an individual, which would respond to verbal instructions, stand still in the air or fly several times faster than sound. She spoke of houses with entrances on their roofs, all ground being used by, by gardens and fields in which to walk and play. She said such vehicles could almost be built now, but all research on them is being suppressed. The way they suppress the thing is to hire all so-called geniuses on the verge of designing it and bury them in this room. Here they're allowed to play out their schemes on paper. Why are they suppressing it? Because this little vehicle lasts a lifetime, uses no steel and little plastic, burns no gas, and can be built by anyone once the principles are known. It would mean the virtual end of assembly lines, road building, oil production. Then, as if anticipating objections I didn't dream of making, she explained, a central computer keeps track of every standing and moving vehicle. At any instant, an infinity of positions and paths is available, so there's never a crash or a bottleneck. Central computer breakdowns are monitored by any number of computers located elsewhere and ready to take over. The sole function of the computers is to prevent crashes and bottlenecks. No one controls the computers. In circumstances where such vehicles would be possible, power over the transportation computers would be as outlandish as power over the world's supply of air. On the way to our next marvel, Sabina walked between Tissy and me. Squeezing me, she said, You look so lost, Sophia, and so frightened. You're really something. You have no facade. All your feelings show on your face. I'm all facade. I'm pretending that I love everything that's happening here. No doubts or reservations will ever show on my face. But half the things that can be done here scare the hell out of me. We entered a room with subdued light, dark curtains, and various strange plastic objects. Sabina continued, I can understand vehicles, but watch this. She operated a switch, and a cup appeared on a table. Grab it. Your hand will go right through it. There's nothing there. This is a way for someone to go anywhere, not in minutes, but instantly. Only the person who goes is no more real than this cup. It's called a hologram. You can stay in your bed while your hologram travels all over the world. You could be standing in front of me looking as real as life until I tried to embrace you. My arms would go through air. You'd be nothing but a projection of light. Isn't that awful? It's part of the same package as the vehicles. When you write Yaristan, tell him I'm not as sure of myself as I once was. Tissy observed, these things would sure make life in prison more bearable. I could at least think you were right there with me. Pat opened his mouth for the first time. I thought they were only into transportation research at this place. They're into everything they can turn into merchandise, Sabina told him. They'd have an orgasm department if someone invented an orgasm machine that contained a ton of steel and used a barrel of oil every time it got you excited. Next, they'd have two such machines getting each other excited while the rest of us lay in prison hospitals chatting with holograms. I rejected Jan Sedlak's attitude to technology all my life, Sophia, but I can no longer convince myself. Hey, what's all this? Tissy shouted. For three weeks you've been teaching me about it, telling me how great it all is. Sabina swung Tissy and me around and pulled us out of the hologram room. You're right, Tissy. It is great. I was only raising interesting questions. Ted, let's show off your hangout. We entered another computer-filled room. Sabina had me sit at a desk and press one of the buttons below the word quantity, and then told me to speak into a microphone. As soon as I'd spoken three words, Ted handed me five slips of paper with the words, I'm completely lost, printed on them. This time, I was the one with doubts and reservations. I'm enough of an environmentalist to know that with such a gadget, every megalomaniac would make millions of copies of his ravings, since he'd no longer have to bother writing them down, and forests would all be depleted in a day. In this department, they've already moved far beyond that objection, probably because the forests are already depleted, Sabina told me. All the world's writings would exist nowhere except in a computer library. There'd be no more book collections, libraries, bookstores, or files. Everyone would have a fairly small computer. Whenever she wants a book or a work of art, the computer produces it for her in a few seconds. She can study it, take notes on it, keep it around. When she's through with it, she deposits it into a paper disposal unit instead of a shelf or a drawer. The same small quantity of paper circulates among all the users of all printed works. If she's devoted to bookshelves, she can have holograms of them along every wall. It's the only positive use I can think of for the holograms. But when she wants a book, she doesn't reach into the shelf but into the computer. When she's through, she deposits the book in the disposal and its hologram into the shelf. There's nothing wrong with this department. They would even introduce it to the present system if steel or concrete or oil or some other large interests were involved. But it takes all the fun out of printing, Ted commented. The computer does it all. That's the point of the whole place, Sabina added. The computer does it all. But let's go eat. There's a good restaurant and there are no computers to do the eating for you. When we sat down to eat, I asked Pat what his impressions were. He announced, the slogans on the walls are fantastic. 
They reflect the most revolutionary acquisitions of the proletariat to date anywhere. Slogans, Tissy asked? I never noticed them. That's because you're not a professor, Tissy, Sabina told her. Professors don't notice anything else. Pat was offended. Slogans are often a concise expression of the theory that informs the proletariat's practice. You must have been part of the student demonstration that came here the day after the occupation, Sabina said to him. Pat grew increasingly offended. I stay away from demonstrations, that pseudo-activity organized by politicians. I asked Sabina about the demonstration. She told me thousands of people had marched towards the newly occupied research center with flags and placards. The gates were wide open and everyone here thought they'd all come inside and turn this place into a popular playground. But would you believe it? All those thousands stopped in front of a soundtrack and listened to slogans broadcast to them over loudspeakers. No one and nothing held them there. When the sloganeers ended, they all dispersed. The open gate remained an impassable barrier to them. Afraid to touch what they said they wanted, Tizzy added. Pat tried to explain. Those people were vendors of political ideologies and their customers. The slogans I liked here aren't expressions of ideology, but of theory. They subject revolutionary practice to demystifying scrutiny, but Sabina insisted, slogans, professor, are what that demonstration was about, the renunciation of the world for the sake of the word. Pat stuck to his point. If the proletariat doesn't regain its revolutionary perspective, the revolution will be stillborn and practical needs will find no genuine revolutionary form. Professor, Sabina began. I'm not a professor and I don't aspire to be one, Pat shouted. Don't be sore, Tissy told Pat. Whenever anyone uses words as big as she does, she calls him a professor. But Pat remained sore through the rest of the meal and for the remainder of the evening. I was very tired soon after supper, and Sabina showed Pat and me to our bedroom, telling us she and Tissy slept across the hall in case we needed anything. Our room was a former executive suite. Its soft carpet made me think of a room Sabina had once described to me, a room with a wall-to-wall -wall mattress. The carpet seemed clean enough, but I didn't avail myself of this luxury. I fell on a large couch next to the wall. Pat sulked in the corner of the room next to a lamp and read a book he had brought along. I had nothing to say to him. He had been out-argued by a woman, and he couldn't accept that. In the morning, he told me he wanted to return to the occupied university. When I insisted on spending at least one more day in the research center, he told me he wouldn't accompany me or my know-nothing friends, but would tour the place on his own, or with the printer. Tissy knocked when we were about to leave our room. It's my turn to give you two a tour. I told her Pat was intimidated by women and went to her by himself. Tissy excitedly squeezed my hand and whispered, Good, I want you all to myself, sis. I wanted you for years. Scared? As we walked away from Pat's in my bedroom, I put my arm tightly around Tissy's waist and told her, I'm frightened out of my wits, but you'll come anyway? To the end of the world, Tissy, I'm all yours, all day long. It was an unimaginably beautiful summer day. The sky was clear, the air was clean, there was a slight breeze. Tissy, the incurable dope addict, led me to Ted's car. After a five-minute drive, she parked by the entrance of what looked like a vast estate. I wanted to show you what the other half used to do during their breaks and lunch hours, she told me. We walked to a fabulous park with covered walks surrounded by thick forest. The morning sun only reached the tops of the trees. There are several streams, a pool, a large lake. I went wild the first time Sabina and I came here. Imagine me after spending all those years in prison and then in that ward. Suddenly shouting, watch this! She dove right through a seemingly solid hedge. Come on through, she shouted. I followed her through the hedge and found myself in a grass-carpeted room completely surrounded by trees. Lying on the grass in a sunlit corner of the room, Tissy told me, Sabina and I found this place by accident. Isn't it great? I'd come here with her every sunny day if she wasn't so busy with her vehicle. I lay down alongside her. Tissy rested her head on my stomach and asked, You mind? No, Tissy, I don't mind. Tears came to my eyes as I ran my fingers through her hair. I'm sorry about what I did to you, Tissy. Tissy pulled my hand to her mouth. You're not the one that should be sorry, Sophie. It was the first time she'd call me by my name. I'm the one that's sorry. You mean about getting me to your room by telling me you were scared? You knew I wouldn't have gone if you'd told me what you wanted. About that, too, but I'm a lot sorry about other things. I had you all wrong. I had everything all wrong. I thought you were just like Sabina and me. Seth wanted you and Tina in the bar, and I wanted those shots more than I wanted anyone or anything. I tried to get you for myself and for Seth at the same time, and I thought you were just pretending you didn't want me. I was sure Jose and Ted had told you I just wanted you for Seth, and I hated both of them. Jose kept me from you, and Ted kept me from Tina. A shock went through me. We both sat up. Ted kept you from Tina? Don't tell me you still think he wanted Tina for himself, Tissy exclaimed. Ted was just like her father. Tina's father, I asked stupidly. Mine too, she added. 
You sure had him figured out all wrong. Ted's the only father I ever had. I could never stand him, but I always loved him, ever since I was little. I never had a real father. I hardly even had a mother. The woman who bore me was a drunkard and a prostitute. I was eight when I had my first sex. It was with one of my mother's girlfriends. I spent most days and nights on the street. That's where I met Ted. He was the best car thief in the neighborhood. He let me move into the garage where he lived. One day we were both caught in a stolen car and sent to reform school. That's where I got the rest of my sexual education. One of the girls I met was a prostitute to rich woman. That's what I did when I came out. But I missed Ted. He was the only person I knew who didn't treat me as a monkey or a rubber doll. He'd always talk to me as if I understood. He tried to teach me things. Some neighborhood kids told me he was out of reform school and was running the garage by himself. I asked him if he still had room for me. He couldn't believe I actually wanted to stay with him. Well, I ain't got no other home, I told him. He soon figured out how I made my money, but he didn't mind. Ted didn't mind anything until I started taking heroin. That only happened after Seth bought the garage and Sabina and Jose moved in with us and started fixing up the house. I went wild over Sabina the first time I saw her. I know you can't understand that, sis. Being in the same house with her day after day drove me crazy. I wasn't a monkey to her, but a person, the way I was for Ted, but I wanted to be more than that to her. She became my goddess. All I wanted in the world was to become her slave. She wanted a house first, and then all the machines. And above all else, she wanted her precious independence. That was why I started taking heroin. That was why I started doing Seth's bidding. I thought I was showing Sabina what kind of independence I wanted, but I didn't show anyone anything. I just got all messed up. I started hating everyone. I tried to drag Tina to the bar, and once I even tried to get her on heroin, that was the only time Ted ever hit me. When you came, I wanted to do the same thing to you. Tissy was crying. I wanted you bad, says real bad, but I wanted that heroin worse, and there was nothing I wasn't willing to do for Seth. I thought he was so good to me. I dragged you to the bar. I would have let them take that pretty body of yours, and I placed my hand over her mouth and pleaded, Don't, Tissy. That's all over. We're both so different now. Tissy pushed me down to the ground, placed her lips right above mine, and whispered, I haven't changed any, Sophie. I still want you as bad as I did then. Suddenly she burst out laughing. You haven't changed either, sis. You're shaking. I'm sorry, Tissy. Don't be sorry. You're just hungry, that's all. She had brought a bag along and started unpacking sandwiches, a bottle of wine, cake. After lunch, I'll take you to another gorgeous spot. She took me to a sandy beach at a crystal clear lake. She ran into the water naked, perfectly unselfconscious. I followed her. The only previous time I swam in the nude was 19 years ago, when Ron took me to a lake by a farm. Tissy and I raised, splashed each other, and then lay on the grass in the sun, our bodies touching. Tissy fell asleep. I found myself looking at her as if I were looking into a mirror. Beneath the seeming energy and determination lay the same passivity, the same longing for dependence. She wanted to be Sabina's slave. What did I want to be to you, to Jose, to Hugh? When she felt rejected and alone, she took heroin. I drifted and stared at blank walls. It was nearly dark when Tissy drove me back to the research center. We had supper by ourselves in the restaurant. It was a beautiful day, Tissy, every minute of it. I don't deserve to be treated so grandly, not by you. Don't be so hard on yourself, Sophie, or on Ted either. I'm the one that messed everything up in the garage. I haven't told you everything. I don't even dare tell Sabina. I wouldn't have any friends left. I'll be your friend, Tissy, always, even if you don't ever tell me anything. When you talk like that, sis, you make my insides jump around. If you and Sabina and I were on an island far away from everything, come on, I'll walk you to your room. Pat was already in the room, reading. I felt happy. I kissed his forehead and asked if he'd spent the day enjoyably. All he told me was, I asked the printer if he could give us a ride back tomorrow. He said he'd be glad to. I lay down on the couch and fell asleep immediately. I woke up with a weight on my chest. I pushed Pat's head away from me and sat up. He started to cry. I'm sorry, Sophie. I didn't want to take advantage of you like this. I, I think I'm in love with you. Ever since we went to talk to the office machine workers. The second time we went, my hand almost touched yours. I felt something funny. I wanted to be close to you. Then you stayed away from me. I thought you knew I wanted to make advances and you didn't want me to. But a few nights ago, after the argument with your former roommate, you squeezed my hand and I felt sorry for him and held his head in my hands. I started to kiss him, but he went on. Then you wanted me to come here with you, and we're alone in the same room at night. I heard you breathing. You were so close, Sophia. You're so beautiful, so intelligent. I dropped my hands from his face and froze. I was so intelligent. For a woman. Sabina was far too intelligent. She intimidated him. But I was just intelligent enough to make him lose his head. 
I lay back down and turned my back to him. I heard him lie down on the carpet next to the couch. I felt sorry for him again and tried to stroke his cheek with my hand, but quickly regretted doing that. He took my hand in both of his, pressed it to his lips, and apparently intended to spend the night in that position. I quickly got a cramp in my shoulder and pulled my hand away. When I woke up the next morning, Pat was pacing, impatient to leave. I left our door open, and as soon as I saw Sabina come out of her room, I told her I'd go back to the council office with Pat. Running out on us so soon, Sabina asked. I was stunned by the way she put it. That's mean, Sabina. I ran out on you and Ron and went to the university. Are you referring to that, or the time I ran out on Jose? I'm sorry, Sophia. It was a mean way to put it. I thought you'd stay with us. Tissy and I both want you close to us. It was my way of saying I'd feel even better about being here if you were here with me. I was crying on Sabina's shoulder. I can't. My mind is all fogged. In the commune and the council, in the midst of leaflets and arguments and news of strikes, I know who I am. But I'm lost here. I don't know who I am or what I want. Tizzy told me about Ted, about herself. I haven't had time to absorb it, any of it. I'll come back, maybe even tomorrow, but I've got to know why I'm coming back, what I want. Just then, Tizzy came running toward us. I'm leaving, Tissy, but I promise to come back. Ah, oh, sis, we both thought you were here to stay. Is it because of me? No, Tissy, please don't ever think that. Before I came here, I was convinced that what I was doing was very important, very meaningful to me. I'm no longer sure. I'd like to find out before I come back. Sabina jumped on Pat as soon as he came out of our room. So, you've had your fill of practice in this time for theory again. Pat said calmly, I recognize the revolutionary character of the appropriation that took place here, but the point is not to appropriate a single enterprise, but the whole world. Is that what you're going back to do? That's what I'm going to take part in. Revolution will be made when all, and not just some of the victims of the market's tyranny, throw off their shackles. That's well put, and just how do you intend to take part in all that, Sabina asked him. By keeping abreast of reality, a radical critique of the modern world must have the totality as its objective. Sabina walked away from him and went to look for Ted. On the return trip, I rode in the front seat between Ted and Pat. I thought of what Tissy had told me about Ted. I didn't know how to begin undoing my gross misunderstanding, my brutal injustice. I whispered to him awkwardly, Yesterday, Tissy told me about everything. I'm sorry, Ted, terribly sorry. I was close-minded and mean. He turned a very sad face toward me. I wasn't so open either, Sophie. I saw Seth's hand behind everyone and everything. I made you suspicious of me. And then the day Jose was released, you couldn't be there to see him because he came to my house, and you wouldn't have come there. He might not have gotten killed if you'd been there. Please don't tell me that, Ted. I was crying. I hadn't run on a Jose only when I left the garage. I had run out on him again when he was in prison. On my third or fourth visit to the prison, Jose had talked enthusiastically about the books I had brought him. He talked about liberation struggles, about the need for the press to arm themselves. I realized that while I was carrying bags full of books to Jose, books describing wars of liberation and revolutionary uprisings, I was dragging myself to a factory job every day except Sunday. The contradiction between the subjects of those books and my own mindless drift became unbearable to me. I couldn't face another conversation with Jose. I longed to do something, anything at all, that would associate me in some way with the subjects of those books. On the day I had accompanied Sabina and Tina to Debbie Matthews' house, Lemisel had mentioned the peace movement, and I had asked Tina if she knew anything about it. Although Tina had contemptuously dismissed the peace movement, she remembered my question and brought me a leaflet about a demonstration. The bottom of the leaflet said, Volunteers welcome, and gave an address. On a Sunday, my only day off, I went to the address on the leaflet, ready to do something. In the Peace Center, I found a room where several people were working at a large table. I asked how I could join the peace movement. A woman pulled an empty chair up to the table, and I spent the rest of the day stuffing envelopes. I didn't get glass in my lungs, but the drudgery was the same as in the fiberglass factory. The activity was what I imagined office work to be. Numerous women stuffing, sealing, and stamping envelopes. A few important-looking men walking in and out of the room. But this drudgery had a justification. It was service and sacrifice for others. There were eight or nine women at the stuffing table and one bearded man. The women were all middle-aged. The man was my age. I sat across the table from him. His name was Art Sinich. He introduced himself to me later that day. They stuffed envelopes right through the lunch hour. No one mentioned food. The mailing got done late in the afternoon. No one thanked me, obviously. I hadn't helped them. I had helped the movement. People started to disperse. They were all going to see each other again at a lecture, which I couldn't attend because of my job. I asked if more work would be done the following Sunday. Art told me he would be there. 
I returned to the Peace Center the, the following Sunday. Art and two or three women were stuffing pamphlets into brown envelopes. The women weren't the ones who had been there a week earlier. Art introduced me to them. I was already a full-fledged member of the movement. The pamphlet stuffing didn't take long, and everyone except Art and I left. I asked him what was done in the Peace Center other than envelope stuffing. He took me to the literature room. I leafed absently through some books and pamphlets. All of them dealt with the same subject, death. Death by nuclear holocaust, by chemical welfare, by radiation from atomic tests. Then Art took me to the Peace Center's print shop and introduced me to the printer. It was in the basement. A large man my age was operating a small printing machine in a space large enough for one small person. He looked like a giant trapped in a cave. What a contrast to Ted's well-lit and spacious print shop. That building should have been called the Sacrifice Center. Finally, Art took me to the reception room. He showed me photographs in the movement scrapbook, pointing to himself at a vigil, at a chemical warfare plant, in a rowboat resisting a nuclear submarine, sitting in at a government atomic energy building. He told me proudly that he'd been arrested every one of those actions. I returned again the following week. Announcements of a major demonstration several weeks away were being sent out. The demonstrators were to block the entrance gate of a military base about to receive missiles that could depopulate half the world. I told Art I wouldn't be able to attend the demonstration because of my job. He looked at me as if I was one of them, the wrongdoers, the warmongers. I already knew that behind the modest, self-sacrificing servant of humanity stood a hardened holy man who towered above ordinary mortals. I didn't have the nerve to tell him I only supported myself. I felt guilty for putting my selfish material interests above goodness and peace. For Art, that selfishness was at the root of all war, all destruction. I stayed away from the envelope stuffing for a week, intimidated by the righteousness, but that only put me back into the situation I had tried to leave behind. I decided to take part in the demonstration and to skip work. I was extremely nervous on the day of the demonstration. I rode with five or six other people to a military sign that said, no public access beyond this point. Several other cars were already parked by the sign. People began to sit across the roadway, about 20 in all, with various homemade signs. It was spring, but the temperature was freezing. I couldn't stop shivering. At last, a huge truck approached. I was stupefied by fear. I was sure we'd all be run over. But the truck stopped, and one of the demonstrators told the driver he was transporting death in the back of his truck. Other trucks came, and drivers gathered at the sides of the road and made various comments to the nuts sitting in the roadway. I knew at the time that all the hatred of the people sitting in that roadway was concentrated on the drivers of the trucks. Twenty righteous people were making themselves an example to the murderers who drove trucks and worked in factories. I also knew that all the peace literature appealed to the moral sense of government officials and the humanity of the rich. When I heard sirens, I clung to Art with mortal fear. At the trial, I was charged with linking arms to resist arrest. I was nearly unconscious with fear when I was carried to the police wagon. I had been arrested only once before, at the carton plant. After a day and a half in jail, I was released on bail put up by the peace organization. The date of the trial was set. When I got home, I called the fiberglass factory and told the foreman I'd been arrested at a peace demonstration. He told me not to bother returning to work. I had succeeded in transforming my situation. I was a full-time political activist. I described my act to Sabina and tried to tell her how worthwhile it had been. I described art to her and tried to tell her how wonderful and good he was. Sabina made no effort to hide her disgust. We shared the house, but we no longer shared anything else. I was jobless and alone. I wasn't able to defend myself from Sabina's and Tina's hostility. I couldn't bear to face Jose's questions about liberation, armed struggle, revolutionary wars. I knew that my act had nothing to do with the subjects of books I had taken to Jose. I knew that I had joined a tiny group of God's witnesses on earth, sent from heaven to stimulate guilt in workers and move the hearts of rulers. I knew I had joined the martyrs of the age, the saints who stood witness to humanity's final cannibalistic act and kept their souls pure. When I saw Art again, he showed me newspaper clippings about our arrest, and he was proud. The arrest was a sign of his personal worth, if not in the eyes of the rabble for whom he only felt contempt, then in the eyes of God and good members of the ruling class. I knew that my act had no relation to Hugh's project house, where the oppressed were to become independent by their own efforts. My new friends found only one quality in the oppressed, guilt. All initiative, all change had to come from the top, from those who rule. But instead of turning my back on Art and his friends, I turned against Sabina, Tina, and Jose. I looked forward to the trial alongside my modest, bearded co-defendant. On the first day of the trial, I told Tina not to expect me home that night. The trial wasn't about missiles or nuclear weapons or war. It was about whether or not we had locked arms when the police had announced we would be arrested, which they hadn't actually announced. 
Afterwards, I drifted to Art's apartment house. He invited me up to his tiny room, part of a subdivided apartment with a common kitchen. The room contained every book and pamphlet I had seen in the Peace Center. He had apparently read them all. There were notes in all the margins. In addition to the pamphlets, there was a single bed, and that was all. He asked if I wanted to stay. I had nothing better to do with myself. For a few nights, we both slept in his single bed. Then I bought a cot. He insisted on sleeping on the cot. He was determined to bear the greater sacrifice. The trial dragged on for two and a half months. Every session was the same. Had we locked arms before the announcement? Had there been an announcement? When Art wasn't stuffing envelopes or demonstrating, he read. I read four or five of his books of pamphlets. Each one of them made the same points in exactly the same way. Only the names and dates were different. After a few weeks, I stopped accompanying to him to the stuffing sessions. I tidied and swept his room, got bookends for his literature. Art didn't see the difference. He was neither pleased nor annoyed. It didn't matter to him. I was a crass materialist for occupying myself with such things. I made up the beds, shopped, cooked, washed the dishes. He didn't once tell me he liked one of the meals I had prepared. He was a vegetarian. Before I had come, he had eaten mainly boiled eggs. I learned that he had never worked because his father, who owned a clothing store and whom Art considered a crass materialist, gave him a monthly allowance. When the trial finally ended, we were all let off on probation, whatever that meant. I never reported to anyone. I bought a bottle of wine to celebrate. Weeks earlier, I had bought a vegetarian cookbook, and I spent several hours preparing a delicacy. I set a cloth on the floor and put candles on it. Art sat down in, as usual, gulped down my meal as if it were a hard-boiled egg, and turned back to the pamphlet he had been reading. Late that night, I tiptoed out of his room. I left him the cot so as to decrease the discomfort of his next guest. In the kitchen, I looked into the phone book and scribbled him a note. Get yourself a maid. Maid service phone number... Dash, dash, dash. I slipped the note under his door and called a taxi. I didn't hear from Art again until I saw him, as well as Louisa, after the riot last year, engaged in envelope stuffing. I was back home with Sabina and Tina, jobless, projectless, aimless. They didn't ask questions. I couldn't have answered any. Gradually, one of my former interests revived. My interest in reading. I made frequent trips to the library and rummaged through bookstores. I hadn't read anything other than a few peace pamphlets since I'd left the garage. Now I spent most of my days reading. Subjects that had rarely been treated when I was a student were now explored in one study after another. In the bookstores, there were entire sections of literature devoted to revolutionary theory, liberation struggles, even philosophical analysis of social and psychological repression. The more I read, the more indignant I became about the narrowness of art's interest. Whenever I found a book particularly exciting, I set it on the living room table. Tina read them. I hoped she'd take them to Jose, but she only returned them to the table. One day she told me she was going to visit Jose, but didn't want to go alone, and Sabina didn't want to accompany her. She trapped me into visiting Jose again. I packed all the books I'd set aside and went with her. In the visiting room, she stood some distance away from Jose and me. He had probably begged her to bring me, one way or another. I gave him the books, but I didn't have the nerve to tell him about my peace movement action or friends. I visited Jose one more time before his release, by myself. It was on that visit I noticed just how much he had been affected by the books I had brought him. I don't want to exaggerate my share. Probably the solitude in which he read the books, as well as conversations he must have had with fellow prisoners, had also contributed their share. I did know that the intentions he expressed, as well as the words he used, came out of the books, since I had just read them. He talked about his intention to take part in the uprising of the oppressed. I was excited at first. I thought he was describing something like Hugh's Project House. But the more he talked, the more frightened I grew. The project house turned into a band of armed guerrillas. Jose lectured to me about the need of the oppressed to arm themselves, to defend themselves with knives, rifles, even machine guns. When I had read the accounts of the guerrilla movements, I had been excited by the knowledge that law and order were collapsing everywhere, that people were responding to arms with arms elsewhere, far away from me. I hadn't for a second imagined myself stealing a truck full of weapons, shooting at police, or pulling the ring of a hand grenade. Before leaving Jose, I tried to tell him I thought activities appropriate elsewhere might not be so appropriate here, but I don't think he heard me. I never saw him again. As the day of his release approached, my fears grew. It had been so easy to carry books to him. I wasn't able to live up to those books, to Jose, to his new commitment. On the day of his release, Sabina told me he didn't want us to meet him at the prison. Several days later, Sabina burst into my room crying. Jose had been shot in the back. The police picked him up just like a dog. Dead in the street, she told me. If they hadn't arrested Ted as a suspect, I wouldn't even have known. Then she added, he had wanted to be someone you could admire. 
I fell on Sabina wailing. He was my whole life, everything I loved. I'm nothing compared to him, Sabina. I couldn't have given him anything. I'd only have dragged him down and made his life ugly. He couldn't have died because he wanted to live up to me, Sabina. You're wrong. You have to be wrong. I cried during the rest of the trip from the research center to the commune. Ted confirmed what Sabina had told me three years earlier, what I still didn't want to believe. Jose had wanted to be ready for me. He had wanted to live up to me. He had mistakenly associated me with the fearless revolutionaries described in the books I had taken him. I was completely oblivious to Pat, sitting silently on my right, humiliated by his two encounters with Sabina. All I saw was Ted, the person whose house I wouldn't have entered, even to be with Jose, because of my suspicions. When we reached the corner where Ted had picked us up, he stretched his hand toward me again and said, almost pleading, When Jose told me you had nothing to do with Seth, I tried to become your friend, Sophie, but it was too late then. I'd like to try again. I squeezed his hand and told him, I'd like to try too, Ted. I saw Ted again the following day, when Pat and Louisa used the print shop to print Pat's leaflet on the loudspeakers. That was the first time I had entered Ted's house. I told him I might accompany him back to the research center when he returned there, but first I had to do what I told Sabina and Tissy I wanted to do. I had to find out who I was and what I wanted. Your letter gave me an enormous clue. It convinced me that I no longer wanted to be what I had been. It filled me with a desire to shatter my past self. Louisa, Pat, and Damon provided me with a perfect setting. I formulated my strategy while riding next to Pat in the back seat of Damon's car, en route from the picket line at Louisa's assembly plant to the revolutionary festival at Louisa's house. I'm aware that Louisa has a strategy too. The whole purpose of her festival is to celebrate her independence for me for the second time, to conquer Damon right in front of her former conscious, and to use me as well as Pat in her conquest. She slightly tipsy from the drink she'd had with Pat in the bar across from her plant, but her determination shows in every move she makes. Damon and I accompany her to the kitchen to help with the dinner. Pat, who had seemed fairly drunk when we'd entered the house, sits on the living room sofa and waits, glancing at the revolutionary acquisitions of the proletariat in Louisa's bookshelf. Men dominate history from living rooms while so beautiful and so intelligent women cook. To Damon's credit, he's totally unlike Art or Pat in this respect. Despite his rigid outlooks, when it comes to chores, he's a perfect egalitarian. He doesn't expect a comrade to be his maid. I'm not the only one who appreciates this quality in Damon. Very few men I've known have followed me into the kitchen, Louisa tells him. Damon blushes and says, I was embarrassed when you had everything ready last time, Louisa. I wanted to help. Oh, have you two celebrated here before, I ask. We certainly have, Louisa answers vivaciously. Damon tried to call you more than two weeks ago when you had already moved into the university commune. He couldn't reach you and thought you might have been kidnapped again, so he called me. I told him where you were. You had called me two days before he did. And I asked him to explain to me what was happening at the university. You hadn't been very informative. He started to explain on the phone, but I insisted he come to dinner. It went off marvelously. Damon told me about the new working class, and I agreed to write my article for the worker's voice. I wanted to help in other ways, too, but since I can't type, there wasn't much for me to do. I did go to Damon's house once and learned to operate the mimeograph machine in his basement. Damon reminds her, In the car you told me you had some suggestion for the next issue of the paper. Did I? Louisa asks absentmindedly, but then she apparently remembers how she got Damon into her house. As a matter of fact, I have several suggestions, but she doesn't make any. Damon doesn't pursue the subject. He doesn't want to antagonize his proletarian recruit. I decide to leave them to their game. I ask Louisa if my room is free. Yes, she tells me. It's as empty as when you left it. Why? Because I want to see it before taking anyone up there, I tell her, running into the living room. Pat looks half asleep. I pull him off the sofa. So I'm beautiful and intelligent too, am I? Yes, Sophia, extremely, he says sleepily. Almost as intelligent as you? He wakes up and blushes. I pull him toward the stairway. Come on, we're going to occupy this place. I'll give you a tour. I pull him all the way to my room. This is where I spent my time dreaming when I was in high school, in this very bed. You mean this is your house, and Louisa really is your sister? Couldn't you guess that from looking at us? No, I couldn't, Sophia. She looks so much older than you. I thought you and Tina were sisters. I push Pat on the bed, slide alongside him, and kiss his lips long and hard. That's the nicest thing you've said to me, Pat. My heart pounds, my limbs are sore from hunger, but I get up. I learned something from Myrna, to wait for the perfect moment, to fan the fire to its highest heat. Pat begs, come back, Sophia, please. I love you. I never loved anyone before. I take his hands, pull him to me, and kiss him again. 
They're waiting for us downstairs. Let them wait, Sophia. I can't. I scold him. How will man dominate history if he can't even dominate himself? Tell me that. He stiffens as if I pull the switch. A woman has dominated the man who would dominate history, turning him on and off like a water tap. I descend victoriously. Pat follows me. I set the table. Damon and Louisa bring out a delicious-looking meal and wine. We start to eat. Pat returns to the topic he had started discussing with Louisa when we left the council office. He becomes sober and alert. His passion vanishes. He's pure intellect again. All theory and history. What did you yourself do after that uprising, Louisa? Earlier you told me people ran everything on their own. What did you run? I operated a tram, Louisa tells him. I gathered that much from your article, Pat says, but your article is full of platitudes. I didn't get any idea of what daily life was like after a so-called takeover by the workers. Was it different than it had been before? Did you drive the trams any differently? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yes, Pat, I understand what you're asking, Louisa says, somewhat peeved, but I'm convinced you don't really want to know. You just want to start another argument which proves that the Union is always wrong. I'd really like to know, Louisa, not for an argument, but for the sake of historical understanding, Pat insists. Damon says, I second Pat's request. I find your experience extremely interesting. Louisa pretends to be reticent. I don't want to start our evening off by talking about myself. And in any case, Sophia has already heard everything I have to tell about my experiences. I'd like to gain some historical understanding too, Louisa. I look at Pat while saying this. Louisa begins the story you and Yazda must have heard countless times. In order to understand what it was like to drive a tram in those days, you have to understand what the whole struggle was about. The working people, together with their organizations. You mean the unions, I interrupt. It's the first time in my life that I've been so sensitive to Louisa's unionism. I feel as if I were in the presence of the trains Denick described to you. In the past, Louisa's story always inspired me. Now I realize that Louisa's life project had never been her own, any more than mine ever was. Louisa took part in a project which the Union defended. I mean the Union, she says calmly. It was only thanks to the Union that the working population was able to defeat the insurgent generals and the entire rebel army. I've heard those terms before, too. She always used them before, but I suddenly hear them for the first time, probably because we're in the middle of rebellion and insurrection right now. Were you on the side of the conservatives fighting against the insurgents? Don't be ridiculous, Sophia. Your terms are ridiculous, Louisa. What are insurgents? They're people opposed to authority, to the state, the ruling class, the status quo. How can you call a general in this an insurgent? A general is the highest official in the service of the established order. A rebel, an insurgent, is someone who rises against the ruling order. A general who suppresses an insurrection so as to restore the ruling order is no insurgent. As for a rebel army, that's like saying dry water or full vacuum. There's no such thing as, as a rebel army. Louisa wins the argument by exclaiming, How easy it is to play games of logic with the dead. Thousands of working people, including your father, lost their lives defending the cause of the workers. You're confusing Nachalo with George Alberts, I shout. Nachalo didn't die fighting against insurgents and rebels, but fighting alongside them, against the ruling order, against discipline. Whatever garbage you've picked up from Yaristan, I won't have you slandering people who fought one of the purest struggles in the entire history of the working class. What do you know about it? Was Yaristan there? What would he have done? What about you, Sophia? What would you have done? I've seen the type of insurgency you exhibit during revolutionary situations. You couldn't catch mice with it. Only the rich had time to play games with logic. Such logical contradictions were what the enemy threw into the working class to divide it against itself. Fortunately, workers recognize each other, and they recognize the enemy in spite of those who threw sand in their eyes by asking who the insurgents and rebels were. Nachalo knew perfectly well who his comrades and who his enemies were. He hated the status quo, passionately. He slept with his rifle. The only bonds he recognized were bonds of solidarity with his comrades. Union comrade, Sophia. He was among the first on the barricades, among the first to join the struggle to defeat the fascist army, among the first killed in that struggle. Louisa turns to Pat. All her reticence has vanished. I'll tell you what daily life was like during those days. I was on the barricades alongside Nachalo and his daughter. She was hit in the arm. She died two days later. The day after she died, Nachalo went to the front to defeat the last outpost of the enemy army. I was ready to go with them. Numerous women joined the militia. In that revolution, they were treated as equals to men. But I would have had to leave two-year-old Sophia as well as the newborn Sabina. The same Sabina I met yesterday, Pat asks. Damon comments, that's very interesting. I decided to stay away from the front, Louisa continues. When I first met Nachalo, he believed men were made to do the shooting and women the cooking. 
After the years he spent with me, he no longer believed that women's place was in the rear. He didn't influence my decision. It was my own. The day he left for the front, I went to Union headquarters to volunteer to do the work that had to be done in the rear. I had driven a tram earlier. I was urged to join comrades reestablishing the transportation network. The street fighting had completely paralyzed the city's transit system. There were barricades everywhere, and in many of them, trams and buses had served as the basic construction material. This had to be straightened out before life could resume. Resume? Wasn't everything being transformed, I asked? I started feeling like the heckler Rhea accused me of being. Louisa disregards my interruption. As soon as I reached the department where I'd worked before, I became a union delegate and joined a commission charged with inspecting the roadbeds and listing the jobs that had to be done before the trams could run again. The following day, the radio called all the manual and technical transport workers to a meeting. The vast majority turned up, except for a few fascists. Everyone, without exception, placed himself under the orders of the Union. And five days after the street combats, more trams were circulating than had ever been on the streets before. To get the additional vehicles, we had to work day and night, in the midst of universal enthusiasm, repairing vehicles which, according to the previous managers, were beyond repair. After only five days, there were more vehicles, each of which was more efficiently operated, thanks to which workers could again be transported daily to the factories where they produced the weapons, I began with sarcasm. But Louisa misses my sarcasm. The weapons were needed for the victory over the enemy. The spontaneous discipline and organization which made possible the resumption of transportation, as well as production, would have been impossible without the Union. That's precisely Sophia's point, Pat tells her. You've just said it yourself. The Union played exactly the same role the managers had played before. I add, I can't actually believe Nachalo would have put up with the work discipline and organization you've been describing. Everything you've told me about him makes me visualize him as too much of a rebel. I've never heard such comments from you, Sophia. We were all rebels. We were too poor to be anything else. My own mother died of disease and poverty when I was 12. My father worked on a road repair crew. It was thanks to him that I met unionized workers, attended the union school. It was through the union that I got my first job. It's well as good to rebel against everything, but I frankly don't understand your hostility to the union. It had nothing in common with the so-called union here. When I was 16, my father was shot by the police. He was taking part in a demonstration protesting the imprisonment of union militants. That happened during my second year at the Union Free School. My father's friends took me to their house, but they were too poor to support me. I wanted to support myself. The union found me a job as ticket puncher on a tram. On my first day at work, I was trained by a man I thought very old, although he was no older than Sophia or Damon are right now. He had a foreign accent and seemed to be a drunkard. He praised me for overlooking passengers who had no tickets. He told me the authorities would shoot me. I learned he did the same thing, and he didn't punch the tickets of people who looked poor. He remained my trainer for a week. He raged against the rich. When I told him how my father had died, he told me he kept a rifle in his room to avenge all the workers killed by capitalists. I was fascinated by the raw violence the man exhibited whenever he spoke about the exploiters. Yet he wasn't in the union, and one of the things he held against the exploiters was what he called the shameful fact that women had to work like men. I decided to give myself my first assignment as union organizer, to channel this man's energy where it belonged, and to teach him that his view of women was inconsistent with his revolutionary attitudes. Exactly what I thought. It was you who got Natchelo into the Union, I exclaimed. That's right. My first assignment was a success, but not right away. After my week of training, I got assigned to a different tram. I looked for him after work. I found him several times and followed him to a bar. He held me in a trance with his stories of a vast peasant uprising in which he had taken part. I talked to him about the Union. But after a few brief encounters, he disappeared. Several weeks passed, during which I moved out of the house of my father's friends and rented a room of my own. I was independent for the first time, and I've been ever since. But I couldn't get Natchelo out of my mind. At union meetings, I asked continually if anyone knew the whereabouts of a foreign worker who didn't punch poor workers' tickets. At one meeting, I learned that precisely such a man had started a brawl with an inspector who went through the tram and discovered three quarters of the tickets unpunched. Natchelo had fought with the inspector but hadn't injured him. Police had arrived and arrested him along with half the passengers. He became a minor hero, but was fired from his job. I was one of a delegation that greeted him when he was released. He recognized me. I told him I was now an independent worker like himself. He was bitter. He told me he was unsuitable company for me. He spoke of himself as a broken man. He even called himself an animal. Then he shouted, Men aren't animals. They can't allow themselves to be continually harnessed and driven. I followed him to the basement hovel in which he and his daughter slept. 
All the way to his building, I argued that an individual can't overthrow the exploiters with his own physical powers, no matter how great they are. He can only do this through union with his fellow workers, through solidarity. Natchala told me he knew he couldn't fight alone, but that the union got on its knees and begged like a cowardly serf instead of the workers simply taking what was rightfully their own. My knees don't bend, he shouted when we reached his room. I followed him in and continued arguing. Before long, a gypsy girl arrived, a wild thing in rags, quick as a cat, immediately suspicious of me. Keeping her eyes on me as if she thought I'd steal something for her, she started pulling vegetables, meat, liquor, and a wad of money out of her large coat. Natula whispered to her in their language, but she still didn't take her eyes off me. I asked her if she had a job. She didn't look older than ten. She told me furiously she couldn't get a job that would support two people, which is what she had to do now that Natula was fired. Then she told me with shameless pride that she'd been a pickpocket since six and a prostitute since eleven. She was twelve. I turned indignantly towards Natchelo and called him a hypocrite for telling me men ought to work while women stayed at home, a fine principle for a man whose own daughter stooped to the worst form of slavery, prostitution. I called him a parasite and a pimp. The gypsy leaped at me like an enraged animal. She bit my arm and shrieked, You come from the church. We don't want the church in this room. Get out, priestess. As she pushed me out of the room, I started crying. Natchelo reached for her arm and shouted at her until she released me. Then he told me, You're right, I'm worse than an animal. He fell on his knees and begged me, stay and tell me about your union. That powerful, violent man was on his knees, begging to learn from me. The gypsy pushed me toward him. I fell on my knees beside him. I told him, I haven't come as a judge, but as your comrade. Tears flowed down the man's cheeks. It was the most moving sight of my life. This man who had survived a revolution in which all his comrades had been wiped out, this violent man, ever ready to reach for his rifle, was crying with shame before me. From that moment to this, I've loved that man more than I've loved anyone since. I pressed his head to my bosom and let him cry. I wanted his comradeship. I wanted him. I wanted his child. I spent that night with him, sleeping on the rags on his floor. I woke early the next morning, bought breakfast for all three of us, and while I was sitting at their table, the girl walked shyly toward me. She kissed the spot on my arm where she had bitten me, put her head in my bosom just as Natchelo had, and begged, I want to be your comrade too. Most of the details are familiar to me. I've always been moved by them. But now I hear something I've never heard before. That little gypsy's initial reaction to Lisa had been identical to that of the other little gypsy. Only Sabina didn't ever change her mind about Louisa. The twelve-year-old girl had called Louisa a priestess. The priestess of the train that would take humanity to its salvation, the Union. The link between Louisa's passion and her calling is suddenly so clear to me she gave herself it to the lowest social stratum so as to elevate it to the salvation train. Isn't that exactly what she did to you? Give to him who hath nothing, like a nun giving a kiss to a leper. Save the wretched from exclusion. Pull them into the Lord's train. Only thus will the world be saved. Margarita was more perceptive at twelve than I am at thirty-four. I convinced them to abandon their hovel and move to my room, Louisa continues. It was larger. Sunshine and fresh air reached it, and it was clean. The gypsy, like I, remained independent. She paid for her own board and keep. But I insisted she not pay for Natula with her prostitution money. I had started driving a tram and could afford to support him as well as myself. She stuck to her trade, willfully, proudly. She always had a knife on her and was the equal of any man, if not in physical strength and in speed. Natula quickly learned to respect my independence. He became deeply involved in union activities. It was in the union that he met others like himself, workers who didn't believe in waiting or in begging. His self-respect and even his pride returned. Pride in himself and in his fellow workers, among whom he now included women as equals. He and his friends carried out nighttime forays against torturers and killers of working people, police, supervisors, informers. The gypsy frequently took part in those forays, but she didn't go with the view of a better world. She went solely to draw the blood of the class that exploited her. When Sophia was born, the three of us moved out of my room and rented a small apartment. It was large enough for weekly meetings even when the number of workers who agreed with Natchelo increased. It was at one of those meetings that I met my second lover. This is new to me. I asked her, before the uprising? I didn't know. I thought, Natchelo, of course you didn't know. Think of the scene you'd have made if I told you. He was a young physics student from abroad, eager to put his knowledge at the service of most revolutionary workers. Union comrades guided him to the meetings held at our apartment. George Alberts? You mean you took up with him before Natchelo left for the front? Louisa laughs at me, acting as if both Damon and Pat were in on her joke, but she misgages them. 
Damon seems shocked. To Pat, it's all equally exotic. You really are a phenomenon, she tells me. One would think that you'd been brought up in a convent. Did I take up with George Alberts? Was I his mistress while my husband was still alive? Is that your question? And you have the nerve to lecture me about the insurgents and rebels? In those days, a rebel was first of all a free person, not just someone who attended political meetings and verbally attacked the state and capital. A rebel was a person whose political beliefs and personal behavior were consistent. I rejected the family, marriage, parental and marital obligations in theory, like you, and also in practice, unlike you. Lovemaking was an integral part of our rebellion, our development as free individuals. I succeeded in teaching that to Nachalo. Who would have expected you to grow up with such conventional notions of family obligations and hypocritical faithfulness? I didn't mean my question that way, I insist, although that's only partly true. I mean that Alberts was so different from Nachalo. He wasn't so different then. At the first meeting he attended, he enumerated the bombs and explosives in his enu- At the first meeting he attended, he enumerated the bombs and explosives his university knowledge enabled him to produce with the cheapest of materials. Everyone loved him. He was witty and he spoke our language perfectly. Looking at Damon, she continues, I've always been profoundly impressed, I should say moved, when a university person, a member of the intelligentsia, sacrifices the privileges available to him and devotes himself to the workers' cause. Of course I took up with him. He became a regular participant in our meetings. All our friends respected him for his knowledge and for his evident willingness to share it. I had another reason for taking up with him, as you put it. I wanted to learn if Nachalo had really understood what I meant by independence. I wanted to test the depth of his understanding of mutual respect. One night after a meeting, when Nachalo and the gypsy both left with the others on one of their forays, I asked George to stay and tell me about his past. Louisa stares up at Damon. She virtually undresses him with her eyes. I took up with him as soon as they left. I showed him exactly how grateful I was for his coming from afar to share his knowledge with us. George rushed away before Nachalo returned. I told Nachalo I had gone to bed with George Alberts. His response was, You're an independent woman, Louisa. You can make love with whomever you please. If my presence ever hinders you, I threw myself at him. I made love for the second time that night. I loved Nachalo more than I would ever love George or anyone else. George stayed away from our next meeting. I found out where he lived and went to look for him after work. Poor George wasn't only afraid of Nachalo, he thought he had wronged me as well. He awkwardly told me that he had fallen in love with the little gypsy and that he thought he ought to have told me that before having an affair with me. He really was in love with her. He said he'd never met anyone so uninhibited, so vivacious, so completely untamed. And he told me he didn't know what to do with his passion, since a 22-year-old student could obviously not make love to an innocent 13-year-old girl. Innocent, I shouted. I called him a blind idiot and told him every man in the Union was more innocent than that gypsy. You hated her, didn't you? I asked. I'd known that too, but I never understood why. Nachalo was a down and out whom you were able to pull up to your Union train. Alberts, the expert with your ideas, was something like a conductor of that train. But Margarita was neither fish nor fowl to you, was she? She continued to carry on her trade. You were unable to pull her up to where you wanted her. Be that as it may, Sophia, I accepted George's admission with Nachalo's open spirit without a trace of jealousy or resentment. In fact, I invited him to dinner the day after I visited him. He came. After dinner, I arranged to leave with Nachalo. We stayed out very late. George and the gypsy were waiting for us. She had asked him to move in with us. He grinned and told us he had learned more from Margarita in a few hours than in all his years at the university. Obviously. After two years in her trade, she was an expert at lovemaking. George went on worshipping her, although she continued to sell herself in the street, to men as well as women. Talk of narrow-mindedness. It was perfectly clear to me that an illiterate girl in her position didn't have much choice. She didn't do it as a sport, but out of need. And she did change a little as a result of her contact with George. Maybe she even started to dream of a day when she could make love because she wanted to, not because she was paid. If George inspired such dreams in her, then he succeeded where I had failed. When that day finally came, when the city's workers rose like a giant to stop the attacking army, the gypsy was the first one to run to the barricades with Nachalo's rifle, nine months pregnant with Sabina. Nachalo ran to a comrade's basement and returned with rifles. All of us joined her except George. He knew how to produce explosives, but he had never held a gun in his hand. He stayed behind to mind two-year-old Sophia. After the first exchange of shots, Margarita was hit in the arm. Nachalo and I carried her home, bandaged her arm, and returned to the barricade. I doubt if George slept for five minutes during the two days before Margarita died giving birth to Sabina, an unbelievable replica of herself, 
a miniature gypsy born with black hair and black eyes. Natula left for the front the day after the gypsy died, and I took up with George again. Isn't that shocking, Sophia? At night, George and I were alone in the apartment with two baby girls. Should we have slept at opposite ends of the room? But he was heartbroken, and I wasn't able to console him. His enthusiasm for the revolution waned. He was consumed by rage and self-hatred for not having been on the barricade instead of her. He started talking about revenge. Not the workers' revenge, but his own. It was already then that he started to slip away from his original commitment. He was temporarily saved for the moment by a young man he met, another foreigner who had come to defend the workers from their enemies. George brought him home. He was in uniform. He had something in common with Pat. Are you talking about Titus the Brown? I asked her. He had something in common with Pat? Are you kidding? Louisa is playing with Damon. Titus was younger than George. He was a theorist devoted to what he called the historical project of the proletariat. He was completely single-minded. He seemed to know exactly what was revolutionary in every situation, what steps had to be taken, what strategy was appropriate. George was more philosophical. His interests were more universal. The suggestion that Damon's interests are universal strikes me as ludicrous, but I repress my objection. His main strategic insight was that all our accomplishments in the rear were meaningless if the enemy was not defeated at the front. He convinced George. They both joined Nachello at the front. I longed to go with them, but I stayed behind with my job and the two babies. A month after they left, George returned home. Nachello was dead. Titus was seriously injured and in the hospital. George himself was completely transformed. He seemed shell-shocked. He told horrifying stories about what had happened at the front. He turned his back on the revolution. I went to visit Titus in the hospital. Damon and Pat seemed to be in a trance. The magnetism Louisa radiates is overwhelming. All my life I've been in the same trance, hypnotized by her, uncritically admiring her courage, her devotion, her determination. All my life I negated my own desires for the sake of Louisa's revolution. If I had become aware of my dependence on Louisa years ago, you would have had a comrade, Yaristan, not just a passive admirer, a frail pretty thing at your revolutionary beck and call. If I had only felt jealousy toward Louisa then, it would have been you who ran to the stockroom with the sheet wrapped around you. I would have carried Nachello's project instead of worshipping it. My love for you would have been an activity instead of a vocation. But I had to experience Jose before I experienced myself as a body, and I had to wait yet another decade to absorb what I would learned from Jose. I get up from my chair, dizzy from all the wine I drank, and walk toward Pat. I take his head in my hands and press it against me. I'm too giddy to listen but not too giddy to proceed with the strategy I dreamed up in the car on our way here. Albert's turned his back on the revolution, so you gave yourself to Titus O'Brien, the soldier of the revolution. It's theorist, the younger of the two. I'm burning with desire, jealous, resentful desire. And why not, I ask? The revolution is a festival, the satisfaction of all desires. Isn't that what we're supposed to be celebrating? Damon snaps out of his trance. Luis's account makes it perfectly clear that certain matters, such as social production, transportation, precede the satisfaction of personal desires. Pat, almost completely drunk, says weakly, If production takes precedence over the real desires of concrete individuals, then the organizers of production take precedence over living individuals, and repression takes precedence over life. Damon objects, I think you both missed the point of what Luisa has been telling us. If revolution is nothing but the realizations of what you call desires, what do you call them, Damon? I snap at him, starting to pull Pat out of his chair. Are you sure you didn't miss the point of what Louisa has been telling you, Damon? She wants you to give her an orgasm, Damon, right here, right now. She's trying to tell you why she wants it from you. Because you're a professor with our ideas. Because you're a driver of the train she serves. Because of your universal ideas. Because you're the one for whose service she pulled Nachalo out of his hovel. And Yaristan, if I'd only been giddy that morning when I was with you on the floor of the carton plant, and if I had known Louisa was going to open that gate, I would have pulled you into me while she had watched. If I had done that, Yaristan, I would have never have dreamt of emigrating. I would have waited for you at the prison gate when you were released. You would have never married Myrna, although you would have spent your life with a person much more like her than I've been. If I had nevertheless emigrated, during my first bike trip with Ron, I would have spent half the night making love to him by the side of the pond, and I have slept the other half, content and happy and unafraid. I'd never have left Ron. He would be alive today, and I might be a successful thief or prostitute. I might have been the one who started the garage. I might have been Ron's girl, and Jose's, and Ted's, probably Tissy's and Sabina's too, each in turn, perhaps all at once. I know I'd never have gone near a university, and I'd never have met Rhea or Lem, Hugh or Alec, Damon or Minnie, nor would I have written you a letter at the time of the Magarna uprising. I wouldn't have needed to. You wouldn't have been arrested because of it. 
Jan would still be alive as well as Myrna's father, and Vesna would have had no reason to play her game. Do I wish, Yarastan? Yes, don't you? I offer that other life in Louisa's dining room. I replay my scene in the carton plant, unfortunately twenty years too late to undo the consequences of the life I've lived, but not too late to put an end to the Sophia I recognize in your letter, a Sophia towards whom I feel no admiration, nor even pity, just contempt. Wrapping my arms around Pat's body, I asked Damon, what does comradeship mean to you, Damon? What do you understand by solidarity? Then I asked Louisa, do you remember Claude Tamnick? Louisa puts her hand on Damon's shoulder and claims, you know perfectly well Damon means exactly the same thing I do, Sophia. To prove it, and to dissociate Damon from Claude, she lifts his hand to her mouth, kisses it, and tells him, this is what I mean by solidarity and friendship, Damon. It's more than articles and meetings and picket lines and arguments. I persist. I'm obsessed with my project. Show, Louisa, show all of us what you mean by desire, Damon. I turn to Pat. And you, show us what you mean by the real desires of concrete individuals, the unity between theory and practice. Show us how men dominate history. Pat tries to pull away from me. I don't understand, Sophia. I just told Damon. Never mind what you told him. Show Damon what you wanted to show me before dinner. Not with words, Pat. With your arms, legs, hips, with your body. Let me remind you. I'm breathing fast. I feel my heartbeats in my head. I'm burning the way Myrna must have burned the day she took her brother the devil to her clearing. And why not? The world is changing all around me. Why wouldn't I change? I've abandoned myself totally only once before in my life, to Jose, in order to show I wasn't perverse, to show him the nature of my most repressed desires, to show I didn't want to be Tina's seducer, but Jose's woman. My determination to prove the existence of my desire itself gave birth to my desire. That was the first time I experienced the abandon of a total orgasm. The irony is that in trying to deny my perversity, I proved myself unimaginably perverse, bathing my entire body in Jose, writhing in semen. But I had been repressed too long to understand what I had done. Out of a shame and denial of sexuality identical to Vesna's, I committed suicide in a fiberglass factory and continued murdering my desires until both you and Louisa held up a mirror that reflected a horribly rigid, sexless porcelain statue, taunting me, provoking me until I can't stand to look at the reflection a second longer. I press my whole body against Pat's side, sliding slowly against his arms, his hips. Don't look away, Damon, I shout. Tell him, Louisa. Tell him this is what you mean by comradeship and solidarity. Louisa holds on to Damon's hand and starts to cry. Did Yaristan tell you about that too? Do you remember what comes next, I ask her? I pull Pat's shirt over his head and start undoing his belt buckle. Pat begs, please, Sophia, not here. Damon gets up and moves towards the door, announcing, this is ridiculous. Louisa, crying, falls to her knees in front of Damon and embraces his leg. She looks up to him like a begging dog. Don't leave me now, Damon. Pulling off my own clothes, I push Pat down to the floor. Desire is ridiculous, Damon. Organization has nothing to do with passion. Solidarity means obedience to the leader's decisions. Comradeship is nothing but a synonym of membership. For you, there's no contradiction between organization and desire because desire doesn't exist. It's expurgated from the revolutionary society. Louisa, do you remember Claude Tamnick? Louisa falls to the ground as Damon tries to walk away from her. He shouts to me, you belong in a mental hospital. That must be what his friend, the dean who fired me, told him. Louisa holds on to him and begs, please don't prove her right, Damon. Pat and I rolled naked on Louisa's living room carpet as if it were Sabina's wall-to-wall -wall mattress. Pat, panting with desire, tries to pull me towards the stairway. I laugh at him and remind him, all the victims of repression have to satisfy their desires, Pat, not just some. Men will never dominate history from bedrooms. That's done in living rooms. Damon reaches the door, dragging Louisa after him. At least sit with me in the kitchen and don't leave me like this, she begs. And then, exactly as Jan expected, all morality bursts into the open and shatters. Pat penetrates and wails, Oh no, I didn't want it to happen like this. Damon slaps Louisa and runs out of the house, leaving her lying by the open door exactly as I'd once left Tissy, crying hysterically. Louisa comes to herself, looks around furiously, and runs to her room, shouting at me, I'll never forgive you for this. I don't know what you're trying to prove, but you're doing it like a sick wild animal. Like a gypsy, I shout back. Pat runs from the open door and grabs the clothes strewn around the living room, exactly as I ran from the street entrance of the carton plant. A porcelain statue is shattered. Pat dresses in a corner of the room and bolts through the door. I bathe in the fresh night air blowing in from the street, immoral to the point of perversity, unashamed, independent. Louisa runs past me without looking at me and slams the door shut. I go up to my room, feeling victorious and free. 
I wanted, and I took in conditions determined by me. Tell Myrna I'm ready now to face all the consequences. I'm ready to face the world. I've been typing for the past 12 hours. Louisa didn't invite me to breakfast before she left this morning. I recently finished the bottle of wine I carried up with me. And yes, I read your second letter as soon as I started writing this one. I lost some of my rage, but not my desire to describe my revolution to you. Outside, there's a general strike. Everything is out of commission. Tomorrow, I'll be part of it again, though I don't yet know which part. I may go back to Sabina and Tissy. I'll try to take Pat with me. I still love you, Yaristan, and I'll go on loving you. Your Sophia.